Thank you for attending Not a Safe Bet, Equitable Access to Cannabis Banking, hosted by the Drug Enforcement and Policy Center at The Ohio State University Moritz College of Law. Before we begin, we have just a few notes we'd like to share with you. First, to streamline the appearance of the webinar, we suggest that you hide non-video participants. To do that, click on the three dots at the top right corner of any participant box that has their video off and click hide non-video participants. Second, we want to draw your attention to the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom window. You may submit questions at any time. Please note, however, that there is only limited time available for the Q&A at the end of the session. Third, closed captioning has been enabled for this event. To change how you view the transcription or to hide it, click live transcript in the menu at the bottom of your Zoom window. Finally, this event is being recorded. The recording will be made available on the event page and social media channels as soon as possible after the event. Follow us at OSU Law BEPC to stay up to date on our research, programming, and future events. Thank you again for joining us, and we hope you enjoy the event. Doug? Thank you so much, Holly, and thank you to everybody for joining us today for uh, what we've been calling the, the Cannabis Regulatory Deep Dive of the Summer. This is our second event, and I am extraordinarily grateful to get a chance to introduce it and then uh, hear the expert analysis that's going to follow. Uh, so you know, I am Professor Doug Berman. I teach here at The Ohio State University Moritz College of Law, and I help run the academic center that's helping to, to support this event, uh, the Drug Enforcement and Policy Center here at OSU. Uh, the role of the center is to try to shape and enrich conversations about criminal justice and drug policy issues and how they intersect, and we give particular focus to cannabis reform conversations, which, which is what today is about, and, and feel incredibly lucky that our center has had a chance to work closely with a number of the cannabis regulator, regulators of color coalition members, particularly Kat Packer and uh, Shaleen Title, who have been instrumental in helping us uh, build out uh, this summer series to talk about a range of cutting edge issues uh, relating to cannabis reform, both at the local, state, and uh, this time, particularly the federal level. Uh, I'm going to now get out of the way and just introduce Maritza Perez, who's the director of the Office of Federal Affairs at the Drug Policy Alliance. She will be introducing our speakers and otherwise taking us forward on this important topic. Thank you so much, Maritza. Thank you. And a huge thank you to CRCC and the Ohio, Ohio State University Drug Enforcement and Policy Center for having me today. I'm very excited about this conversation. By way of background, the Safe Banking Bill has passed the Chamber of Congress seven times as of today. There's a perception that this bill is bipartisan, but in fact, many lawmakers have joined advocates in calling for the bill to be amended to intentionally address equity in the industry, particularly because this may be the only marijuana bill that moves this Congress. For instance, Senator Booker says, for decades, largely black and brown communities have been disproportionately harmed by prohibition and are subsequently underrepresented in the emerging billion dollar cannabis industry. We all agree that the path to ensuring true equity within the marijuana industry starts with decriminalizing cannabis at the federal level. But before moving forward, legislation like safe banking requires changes to ensure that communities most harmed by broken marijuana policies receive support, and that small cannabis businesses can have the same access to capital as large multi-state operators. We agree. Each of the times the safe banking bill has passed the Chamber of Congress, we hear the same thing, that the bill may not entirely fix the financial system or reverse institutional racism, but at least it's an incremental step in the right direction. But we don't agree with that perspective and believe that, that if the goal is in fact to take a small step in the right direction, the best way to create an incremental measure toward justice is to ensure that the direct beneficiary of the law, the banks, only receive the benefit of safe, of safe harbor if they demonstrate compliance with existing anti-discrimination laws and make an effort to build an equitable industry. So with that, I want to introduce our panelists today. Um, I'm very excited to be introducing and uh, speaking with this brilliant group of women. Um, so when I call your name, if you could just, uh, yeah, if you could just join us on stage, thank you. Um, beginning with Kat Packer, um, who is the vice chair of the CRCC, the Cannabis Regulators of Color Coalition. Shailene, thank you for joining us. Shailene is the co-founder of CRCC. Uh, Rafi is the treasurer of CRCC. And uh, Dashita Dawson is the chair of CRCC. Um, I encourage our audience to read everyone's long bios that you can find in the white paper um, because we have a wealth of knowledge here. So I want you guys to know everyone's full background. But for the purposes of time, I'm going to hand it over to Dashita to share more information about who CRCC is. 
Thank you so much, Maritza. So founded in 2020, the Cannabis Regulators of Color Coalition is a coalition of government officials appointed or selected uh, to lead, manage, and oversee regulatory and policy implementation for legal medical and adult use cannabis markets across the nation. Um, as leaders in post-prohibition cannabis policy, we're focused on equity-centered regulation, industry best practices, and cannabis competency and standardization. Overall, our mission is to be a source of education uh, for legislators and government agencies that aim to identify and eliminate racial disparities in cannabis policy and that want to build sustainable cannabis regulatory frameworks that are actually designed to deliver on what we believe is a reparative and restorative potential of the global cannabis legalization and decriminalization movement. Uh, with that being said, I'll pass it back to you, Marissa. Thank you. Um, and this is a question for Tashida and all the panelists, um, but can you just share, I think, you know, it's, it's important to ground our audience. Um, so if you could just share some information about CRCC's position on the safe banking bill as currently written. Yes, yeah, so we've been uh, pretty vocal <laughs> for the uh, you know last year and some change uh, re related to the current bill as is. Overall, you know, CRCC has um, not supported safe uh, passing as is, which I think surprised a lot of people out the gate, given how much support it was being given across cannabis equity leaders. Um, in general, we felt that the marketing plan for the bill was misaligned with the details of the actual bill um, in terms of the impact. Uh, there was a lot of use of black and brown bodies to tell the story around safe. Um, as a bill, but the bill itself is one for institutions. And the benefit is actually mostly for the final financial services industry and not for the individuals. There's a lot of hope behind the bill, certainly. Um, and it is, you know, something that we're, we'll discuss today. But overall, what we found was the incongruence with what the bill actually says it will do. Um, and then of course, our knowledge of the cannabis space already and our previous experience as we'll get into uh, what we actually project it will do um, uh, incongruent with what we have a history of in this country. Thank you for that. So with um, the theme of just, you know, filling in our audience and giving them more background, um, whoever would like to answer this, please jump in. But um, what are some of the claims that folks are making about SAFE? Um, that, uh, you know, that you address in this paper? So I, I think one of the claims, and, and this was really a, a campaign that was initiated uh, by some different organizations in the cannabis space, but the claim that I think I've been most frustrated with thus far is this claim that uh, safe, the Safe Banking Act is uh, being passed for equity. Uh, as if that is the goal uh, of this initiative. And the reality is that the Safe Banking Act has passed seven times thus far, uh, but it does not mention the word equity, uh, not once. Uh, and so I think as Dashita mentioned, there's this disconnect between some of the campaigns that have been led in support of SAFE uh, and the actual impact. It's, uh, difficult, I can tell you, as a former organizer, uh, as a former regulator uh, in this space, it's difficult to uh, move forward and advance equity uh, when we can't even acknowledge and name it in legislation. Would anybody like to add to that? Any other claims? I would also just add that there's a lot of confusion around uh, the, you know, the bill itself and what it will do. So a lot of claims about it will resolve uh, 280E frustrations. We, we know that that's not the case. Um, we, it, you know, a lot of claims around um, cash handling and merchant services, um, when in reality, there have been many workarounds and the majority of uh, dispensaries uh, currently licensed actually do have some sort of 
um, uh, merchant services, although they may be paying astronomical fees for it. But then when you talk about the fees, that was also something that it's going to reduce the fees. There was nothing in this bill as is that really uh, put even a cap on the fees. Um, in fact, the banking industry goes largely unchecked as far as that is concerned. Um, and it's a lot of hope that with more access and less risk that um, banks would actually uh, make this conversion. So for me, the claims really were uh, to me again to get people galvanized around the bill to force the hand of, uh, and and maybe change focus from a more comprehensive bill when we realized this it was really important for crcc to kind of step in and not say okay the bill is not exactly what we want but what do we need to actually fix it or address it with solutions. And so we set out with that in mind um, in, in addressing the bill that we did want to create solutions that were financial services specific that would be able to be um, potentially passable. Just one more claim that I wanted to add is that um, there was a widespread, often repeated claim earlier on that this would address the access to capital issue. And a lot of people um, started asking questions about how that would work, or at least what the theory was. And rather than it being addressed, the talking points seemed to just pivot away from that to new talking points, which I think we all found concerning. Kat, were you going to jump in? Uh, I was just going to say, uh, I, I wrote down some of the quotes that were listed on Perlmutter's uh, website uh, that uh, articulated support of SAFE, and I just want to read a few of them because I think it highlights and demonstrates the disconnect uh, between what folks are claiming uh, the SAFE Banking Act would do and reality. Uh, and so I'm not going to name any of these organizations, but you could visit Perlmutter's website, uh, his SAFE Banking Act page, and identify these yourselves. Uh, it says, in quote, alleviate the problem of minority equity access within the cannabis industry in crucial ways. It would ensure that minorities that were affected by the war on drugs are properly represented. Uh, it would create a sustainable future for small cannabis businesses and stop the unjust criminalization of cannabis. Safe and equal banking for all. Uh, these things aren't true. Uh, these are, are not things that the Safe Banking Act would accomplish. Uh, and not that these aren't important goals, uh, but I think our point is, is that if this is the type of reform that we're seeking, the Safe Banking as is, uh, is not a safe bet. Uh, and we have more work to do. And so hopefully we can share some of the work that we've done thus far uh, and some of the strategies that we think will help move this conversation forward. So we've talked a bit about what the safe banking bill won't do. Kat, can you tell us what the safe banking bill will do? What, what is part of the safe banking bill for folks who don't know? Absolutely. So the Safe Banking Act essentially does three things. It provides protections for financial institutions, requires updated guidance from federal banking regulators, and will require new studies and reports. Uh, I'll talk about each of these three things separately. Uh, first, I'll talk about SAFE's protections for financial institutions. I think it's important to start with a little bit of context about uh, federal laws and consequences related to cannabis banking. Federal laws, namely the Controlled Substances Act, the Bank Secrecy Act, and anti-money laundering laws criminalize activities involving cannabis and cannabis-related proceeds. Because of these laws, financial institutions that provide financial services to the cannabis industry could be subject to severe legal and regulatory consequences, even when doing business exclusively with cannabis operators that are compliant with state laws that authorize medical and or adult use cannabis. To protect financial institutions from these consequences associated with activities involving cannabis and cannabis related proceeds, SAFE would prevent federal banking regulators from penalizing financial institutions solely for providing financial services to legitimate hemp and cannabis businesses. And hemp uh, and legitimate here is defined as complying with state laws in the 2018 Farm Bill. 
the legislation would also protect financial institutions and their personnel from some legal liability under these aforementioned laws uh, when providing services to or investing proceeds derived from uh, compliant businesses. Of particular note, for anti-money laundering purposes, SAFE would declare that proceeds derived from state legal cannabis businesses are not considered proceeds derived from unlawful activity. Next, I'll talk about SAFE requirements, SAFE's requirement for updated guidance from federal banking regulators. SAFE would require federal banking regulators to update guidance for financial institutions serving cannabis businesses and hemp businesses and would require those businesses to comply uh, with said guidance. SAFE would also require the Financial Institutions Examination Council to develop uniform guidance and examination procedures for depository institutions that provide financial services to cannabis related businesses or service providers. Last, I'll discuss the reports and studies required by SAFE. SAFE would require banking regulators to issue reports annually on information and data regarding the access to financial services for minority owned and women owned cannabis related businesses and any regulatory or legislative recommendations for expanding access to financial services for minority owned and women owned cannabis related businesses. It would also require the Government Accountability Office to study barriers to marketplace entry, including uh, barriers associated with the licensing process and access to financial services, along with any regulatory or legislative recommendations. Uh, there are also some other uh, studies that are required related to suspicious activity reports uh, and uh, a requirement, new requirement that would prevent agencies from requesting or ordering a financial institution to terminate a customer account unless the agency has a valid reason for doing so. Uh, and that reason is not based solely on reputational risk. Uh, of important note, uh, SAFE explicitly states uh, that nothing in SAFE, nothing in the SAFE Banking uh, Act will require a financial institution uh, to provide financial services to a cannabis related business. Thanks so much for that overview, Kat. That was really helpful. Um, I see that someone has dropped the link to the paper in the chat, which is great. I encourage all of our audience to download it. But before we move forward with the conversation, Kat, is there anything about the paper that you'd like to point out? Absolutely. Um, I, I first just want to thank the center uh, for supporting us in our effort, supporting the Cannabis Regulators of Color Coalition in our effort to uh, assess these issues and to put out a paper and also to thank the uh, stakeholders who helped us uh, formulate uh, these different strategies. Um, just an overview of our paper that's now available for folks to see. Uh, it details existing federal laws and consequences uh, related to cannabis banking, explains uh, what the Safe Banking Act actually does uh, and why we believe that SAFE is unlikely to result in equitable access to banking, even if it results uh, in increased access to banking. Uh, our uh, paper also provides 10 recommendations which detail how the Safe Banking Act uh, or other cannabis banking legislation for that matter uh, could be amended to more equitably achieve cannabis banking reform. Thanks. Um, next, I'm going to turn to you, Shalene. You, you're a longtime drug policy and equity advocate. Um, we know that you were appointed to serve as one of the inaugural commissioners of the Cannabis Control Commission in Massachusetts. So as a former regulator, can you give an overview of why SAFE is not likely to result in equitable access to cannabis banking? Yes, I'd like to start with an anecdote um, because I wanna make it clear that not all of the support for SAFE comes from a sinister or ignorant place um, by pointing out that I supported SAFE at one point. And in particular, I wanna tell a story from when I first started as a regulator, um, there was a lot of talk about the piles of cash that we were going to have in Massachusetts. That was, that was a phrase that was always being thrown around, piles of cash, no bank account, you can't get a bank account, um, you can't get electronic payments. 
And so we built, the Department of Revenue physically built um, tax collection counters around Massachusetts to collect these piles of cash. Um, and I did think to myself as a patient that I had always been able to use my debit card, um, but saw no reason to you know, deny this clear narrative about the piles of cash. And so now, uh, four years later or so, as we were writing the paper, I was wondering what happened. So I put in a public records request to ask the Department of Revenue as a data point how much cash had been collected versus electronic payments, zero. No piles of cash, not even one penny. And I think that shows that sometimes you just hear these narratives and you have no reason not to believe them. And I think that's a lot of where this idea that SAFE is going to lead to equitable access to banking is coming from. But in fact, the problems have not even been vetted, let alone the solutions. And so after looking at this, I think there's three main reasons as outlined in the paper why SAFE would not lead to equitable access to cannabis banking. And the first is that Although the federal government has been aware of the existence of banks serving uh, cannabis businesses since 2014, their primary response has been chiefly to provide guidance. We have not seen severe consequences. And so there's not a real risk um, that would be addressed here. The second is that, as Kat noted, SAFE would not explicitly require financial institutions to provide uh, cannabis banking services. And so if you are a current business where banks do not want to provide you services, arguably SAFE is not going to change that because the banks will continue to have the discretion for who they want to serve and how. And then third, Without additional efforts to acknowledge and address equity as our recommendations have laid out, it is very likely that racial inequity will be perpetuated and perhaps even worse so because there is racial inequity in the financial services industry and that is compounded by the federally illegal status of cannabis. And so there's no theory um, being put forth, and there is no language in the safe banking bill that would address either of those things. I'll turn it back to you, Marissa. Thank you. Um, Rafi, I wanted to kick it to you. As a former banking regulator and a compliance officer, can you share some information related to the current state of banking um, today and specifically risk assessments? Sure. Thanks, Maritza. Um, indeed, I am a reformed banking compliance officer turned cannabis regulator, and I have experience as um, federal regulatory bodies too, having started my career at uh, OFAC and at FinCEN. So it really doesn't surprise me um, that Ashley, you know, just spoke about that law enforcement and regulator regulators' um, response has been one of education and providing guidance rather than penalizing uh, financial institutions solely for providing uh, financial services to the cannabis industry. Um, eight years ago, when FinCEN issued guidance that acknowledged those state initiatives to legalize certain uh, cannabis-related activities, as well as financial institutions that were already providing or seeking to provide services to cannabis-related businesses, um, this guidance reiterated the illegal status of cannabis under the Controlled Substances Act and identified you know, where federal law enforcement priorities lied um, established uh, under the Cole memo in 2013. But this guidance clarified that financial institutions could indeed provide services to uh, cannabis related businesses consistent with um, their BSA obligations, their Bank Secrecy Act obligations to file suspicious activity reports on uh, unlawful activity. And so since this guidance was released, there's been an increasing number of financial institutions providing services to the cannabis industry. Um, so as of September of last year, um, that's the last date for which data is available. Uh, FinCEN reported that 755 depository institutions uh, claim to provide some sort of financial services to cannabis related businesses. And that's up uh, from about 680 uh, just a year prior. Um, however, this figure is disputed, and many in the cannabis and the financial services industry both place the number closer to about 200 and 250. So, you know, although regulators are characterized by, you know, be, having strong, flexible administrative powers, but to date, no regulator has brought 
sanctions against a financial institution simply for providing services to a cannabis related businesses. Um, and to drive that point home, uh, that cannabis businesses in and of themselves are not the problem. Just last month uh, in July, uh, federal banking agencies issued a joint statement reminding banks that they have to take a risk-based approach to assessing and managing customer relationships rather than decline to provide banking services to entire categories or industries of customers. So um, rather than ra regulatory action, um, it's really internal risk assessments and compliance costs that determine whether an institution is going to onboard a cannabis business. So I spent years designing risk assessments and risk rating models for financial institutions and looking at the risks associated with their products, their services, their geographic locations, uh, their customers, and the associated mitigating controls. And so it's really based on these factors that you know, some clients and industries simply fall outside the risk appetite of an institution and they're going to experience uh, challenges accessing uh, financial services. So despite this reality, um, proponents of SAFE frequently make the claim that safe harbor for financial institutions is going to automatically translate um, into access for smaller and minority owned cannabis businesses who currently lack access to capital. And that's, I mean, that's simply not true. Access to financial services is going to remain at the discretion of individual financial institutions. And it's gonna be highly dependent on their perception of risk and profit. And as Kat stated, um, nothing in SAFE um, requires that institutions take on cannabis uh, related businesses. It explicitly states that in the SAFE Banking Act. So in addition to these kind of enforcement and reputational concerns um, that haven't really come to fruition, uh, financial institutions cite the high cost of compliance with FinCEN's reporting requirements. And it's really unclear if or by how much these costs are going to be reduced under SAFE. Uh, the Safe Banking Act establishes that you know, proceeds from transactions involving uh, legitimate businesses are not going to be considered unlawful activity. So it should follow that uh, marijuana limited SARS and the really high uh, compliance costs associated with them um, should be significantly reduced. Nonetheless, uh, that's not spelled out in SAFE. And to date, FinCEN has not signaled how it will interpret this mandate and whether it will continue to require extensive reporting um, or, or not. And finally, um, but most importantly, I want to reiterate you know, what, what Kat said earlier, increased access to banking does not mean equitable access to banking. Repeat, increased access does not mean equitable access. So SAFE could result in increased access to banking overall while still allowing financial institutions to limit the range and the depth of services to the industry. Having drafted AML policies and procedures up until just two years ago, it's not hard for me to imagine financial institutions adopting uh, KYC and onboarding policies that require potential customers to evidence a certain amount of capital, um, demonstrate an ability to operate across multiple jurisdictions, or business ownership that excludes individuals with any criminal history. Um, similarly, financial institutions could charge higher fees for categories of businesses and persons um, that are considered higher risk. Um, and so if financial institutions really continue these existing patterns and practices, the benefits of any expanded access to capital and financial services is going to disproportionately aid large, well-resourced businesses rather than those owned by Black, Brown, and Indigenous persons, persons who are low income or who have passed cannabis convictions. And those are the people who we are trying to help. Those are the people who are most harmed by cannabis prohibition and its enforcement. Thank you so much for breaking that down. Incredibly helpful. Um, Dashita, I'm going to turn it back to you. Um, as somebody with a robust uh, business background and currently you're also the you know, head of City of Portland's cannabis program, um, can you tell us about current disparities in the financial services industry that you see? 
Well, Rafi definitely broke it down. And I think it does start with this idea and we'll probably continue to hammer this home that increased access is not the same as equitable, equitable access, particularly when we talk about our financial services in the United States. We've been working at this since the 1930s um, and have uh, multiple acts, the Fair Housing Act, Equi Equal Credit Opportunity Act, and the Community Reinvestment Act um, as um, tools, if you will, to help fight the disparities in the financial services industry that continue to persist today. And overall, what we can tell from reports as recent as 2021, including one from the Federal Reserve, these tools are not working. The racial wealth disparity still persists. We see a uh, median net worth uh, for white families that is 7.8 times more likely than black family. Black families, and this is really due to the fact that we have a history of federally supported um, banking and financial service um, discrimination, um, racial discrimination to be exact, um, uh, for uh, multiple decades. And Safe Banking Act does not address any of it. And so um, without kind of trying to belabor, again, some of the points that Rafi really broke down, what I'll say is that we definitely included in the paper a scenario. And I definitely think if you're an operator, you got to work wa walk yourself through that scenario. Um, increased access not only gives access to the David in the situation, but it also gives increased access to the Goliath. I found that we've heard the story about Goliath doesn't need increased access. That certainly may be the case, but my experience is a Fortune 100 corporate executive is that if Goliath knows that he has an advantage, he will take it. Um, that is how capitalism, capitalism works in America. And so as soon as there is increased access, there is nothing preventing multi-state operators from getting that. But I will also caution folks that this increased access is a foretelling um, without it, of course, including equity, but it's a foretelling of what the big pharma, big uh, CPG, big retail, um, big tobacco and alcohol, alcohol can also do in the industry. And so um, this isn't a bill for the little person. It definitely isn't a, a bill for black and brown people. Um, one of the last things I'll just point out is that in this scenario, let's say safe passes as is, um, we currently already have a, a real issue with black and brown access to be honest, just access to um, banking services, especially after COVID. Um, we've seen many communities with their bank uh, uh, bank uh, locations closed. Um, we also continue to see uh, disproportionate lending rates um, despite uh, 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 on par or higher credit scores. And so we just imagine that if this unchecked discrimination that already occurs in the banking um, uh, um, industry translates into cannabis, you add to that the federally illegal cannabis, you add to that all of the equity programs that we are working on across the country include people who have a past uh, criminal record, um, then we will see that entrepreneurs particularly black and brown ones with this makeup will have fewer banking options, weaker banking relationships that are already going in and ultimately um, lower loan approval rates. They'll also have lower business credit scores, pay higher rates and banking fees and be subject to what Rafi described as more restrictive terms and conditions um, than white counterparts, all the things that you have to prove to even get an account. Um, we actually see this as widening the gap especially if it goes unchecked. And there are some of the things that we are about to get into that I'm excited about are solutions to try to check that, to get a rein on it. It's hard because the banking, again, industry is unchecked. But for cannabis specifically, we don't have to start off at that point. And so I think that that's what we're offering up today. Thanks. And then before we dive into the specific recommendations in the white paper, Shalene, can you tell us about what current opportunities there are in Congress right now for these amendments that promote equity? Sure, um, and I think this is a good time to also just um, reflect on how organically this, these set of recommendations came about really at the perfect time. And if there are, are other people who have been um, up until now opposing safe because you share these concerns, this is the perfect time to get involved. And I hope these recommendations are a great starting point for you. Um, Maritza, I remember you and Mike Wazuski at DPA being the first people I knew of that were really listening to these concerns and taking them seriously. And then Dashita, you speaking about it in a way that really made people listen and understand. And then Rafi, by some divine intervention with her banking expertise, came in at just the right moment. And then Kat, 
very, very thoughtfully putting all of this together with evidence to be uh, the lead author on this paper and uh, OSU's DEPC in its mission to enrich the dialogue um, has published this paper for public scrutiny, public feedback. And this is really the time because if you agree, um, I tweeted the other day that I was optimistic about safe banking for the first time and people were very interested in why. And the reason is both legislators and their staff and the public seem to have shifted on this versus say six months ago. Um, what we're seeing is a interest in multiple avenues. So of course, safe could be amended, which is the purpose of this paper. And I think a central focus because we want safe to be equitable on its own as an incremental step in the right direction. And then there's the concept of safe plus, which I understand to mean adding unrelated but positive criminal justice measures and reforms to safe. And then there are excellent um, banking measures in the newly released CAO Act as well. So there are many different elements to work with and many different avenues to push from. Uh, but the most important thing is that we start from a place of really vetting these recommendations and uh, have excellent policy positions that are going to work in the real world. Um, and I think it's important that we focus on that before skipping ahead to negotiation, because frankly, sometimes what we see from the public, especially like six months ago, is Okay, what do you need? What scraps do you need so the equity people will just shut up? You know, and that's that's not the conversation that we're going to have. And so I hope this paper and these recommendations are are a good starting point. Thank you. Now for the exciting part, we can actually dig into the recommendations found in the paper. So if you haven't downloaded the paper yet, I would recommend that you do that now. You can check in the chat and you have the link right there. Um, it might be helpful to just follow along. Um, there are several recommendations and if you download the paper now, it might be easier to follow the conversation. Um, but with that, um, Shalene, I'm gonna turn it back to you to kick it off with um, an overview of recommendations one and two. Great, um, I'll start with recommendation one, which is use revenue collected by 280E to create a fund providing capital for businesses owned by people harmed by the war on drugs. I think it's really important on principle to start with this one, because as I mentioned, this was the primary marketing plan, as Dashita called it, for SAFE. And that was intentional because this is also the number one challenge faced by the small and minority owned businesses that this is intended to help. And so 280E makes sense because it's revenue that is already being collected. Um, but I do want to clarify that we're not advocating um, that 280E is a good thing. It should be reversed. We spoke to Wanda James, the CEO of Simply Pure yesterday, and she is a vocal critic of 280E. And she said, paraphrasing, yes, of course, it should be reversed. But while the federal government is taking in all of this money, it should be used to address the harms of the war on drugs and specifically to provide capital. So that's why this is the first recommendation. The second recommendation is as a condition of safe harbor, require financial institutions to demonstrate compliance with anti-discrimination laws, such as the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. And it's important to note, we are only asking banks to demonstrate compliance with existing laws that they should already be complying with, just like any other law, just like any other cost of doing business. And so um, I highlight this one because all of the times that the bill has passed, um, there's been this discussion of, well, it may not fix everything, but at least it's an incremental step forward. And if we want to have an incremental step forward, then we should make sure affirmatively that banks are complying with anti-discrimination laws and to address a lot of the excellent points that Rafi and Dashida brought up that they're showing that they're offering terms at the same rates, uh, the same terms commensurate with other groups as to small and minority owned businesses. And frankly, if banks are not willing to affirmatively show that, then, and we're not willing to ask them to, then we should stop presenting SAFE as an equity bill. I'll turn it back to you, Marissa, for the rest of them. Thanks. Let's dive into recommendations three and four. And for this, I'll turn to Rafi. Um, so if you could please just do an overview of three, four, and then seven. 
Sure. So our third recommendation is to amend SAFE to explicitly provide protections for minority depository institutions and community development financial institutions to reduce their perception of regulatory risk uh, when offering commercial loans and transactional services to small minority owned uh, cannabis related businesses, CRBs. Um, Congress and federal regulators have long recognized the importance of MDIs, minority depository institutions, to foster the economic viability of underserved and disinvested communities. So given the longstanding commitment of MDIs to the same communities that were targeted by the war on drugs, it's imperative that cannabis banking legislation explicitly preserve, protect, and invest in MDIs. Uh, they represent 3% of U.S. banks and hold only 1% of U.S. bank assets. Um, and so while their total assets of MDIs have grown over the past 10 years, uh, we are losing minority depository institutions at a rapid rate. Uh, we've seen a decrease uh, over the last 10 years, and 20% of, of MDIs are, are gone now. So it's really imperative that those institutions that are uniquely uh, positioned to repair communities receive not just safe harbor, but also incentives to provide financial services to cannabis-related businesses. This strategy is uh, beneficial for both the MDI and for the cannabis-related business um, as it would give CRBs better access to business lending and other banking services, uh, while simultaneously uh, increasing the assets of MDIs. And in addition to this focus on uh, minority depository institution, cannabis banking legislation should um, explicitly protect and incentivize uh, community development financial institutions due to the outsized role that they play in areas of lending that are particularly relevant to the cannabis industry. Commercial real estate, small business, and agricultural lending by CDFIs far exceed their relative size in the banking industry. Um, according to the FDIC, um, CDFIs hold like 30% of commercial real estate loans, 36% of small business loans, and 70% of agricultural loans. I mean, these are the exact types of financing that's most needed by cannabis entrepreneurs. So let's go ahead and place language in SAFE that acknowledges the contributions of MDIs and CDF CDFIs, and that encourages their support of and uh, engagement with the uh, cannabis industry. This is language that currently appears in section four of SAFE. We've just amended it, uh, calling explicit attention to uh, MDIs and CDFIs. Our fourth recommendation is also related to MDIs and CDFIs, and it's to raise the evidentiary requirements and limit enforcement penalties um, for servicing legitimate cannabis businesses. Uh, since federal legalization uh, legislation, sorry, um, does not explicitly define unsafe and unsound practices, we are left only with examples that are garnered from administrative hearings. So we would like it spelled out that in an enforcement action against an MDI or a CDFI, it should not be considered an unsafe or unsound practice because the institution has provided services to a legitimate cannabis businesses, uh, legitimate cannabis business, or for further investing any of that income derived um, from providing such a service. Um, further, in the event of an enforcement action, um, any hearing or judicial review should be adjudicated for a violation of law under a clear and convincing evidence standard. Uh, these actions may encourage you know, more MDIs and CDFIs who can be uh, more risk adverse um, to provide services to cannabis related legitimate businesses. And Maritza, I think you wanted me to skip over to recommendation seven, is that correct? Yes, please, thank you. Sure. Um, so recommendation seven uh, clarifies that you know, cannabis criminal records are not an automatic red flag. So the existing fencing guidance from 2014 identifies red flags that indicate that cannabis businesses may be engaged in activity that violates state law or implicates federal enforcement priorities. And so among the red flags identified is negative information, such as a criminal record or cannabis arrests, or involvement in the illegal purchase of uh, or sale of drugs. And so given the uh, disproportionate impact that you know, cannabis prohibition has had on black and brown communities, 
guidance from FinCEN and regulatory agencies should clearly exclude prior cannabis-related criminal records from being automatically considered a red flag. You know, at the state and local levels, many jurisdictions are explicitly including allowances for individuals with cannabis arrests or convictions to enter the legal industry. So excluding these same individuals from accessing financial services runs counter to the justice and equity goals of our state and local governments. And really, um, this isn't explicitly spelled out in our recommendation, but beyond FinCEN issuing guidance, in order for this to be truly effective, financial institutions should reimagine what a prior cannabis conviction really means. Instead of it being a red flag, rather it's a green light indicating that a potential customer has prior experience that may positively impact the success of the licensed legal cannabis business. When that criminal record appears during customer screening and onboarding, it can be an opportunity for the financial institution to open a conversation rather than shutting down communication. Um, I don't know, who knows? Maybe I'll go back to banking and work really diligently trying to institute um, these types of reforms because I think that's, that's really the crux of it. Thank you so much for that. Um, so Kat, I'm going to turn to you to take it, take us home um, with the rest of the recommendations. Um, I know that you're, you know, have a lot of experience with uh, promoting an equitable policy, especially as the former and first ED of the City of Los Angeles Department of Cannabis Regulation. Um, can you walk us through the rest of the recommendations, please? And for those following along, these are recommendations five, six, eight, nine, and ten. Absolutely. Thank you, Maritza. I uh, will walk through the next several set of recommendations. Uh, first, we're recommending that SAFE be amended to expand required federal guidance and reports to promote equity alongside diversity and inclusion. Uh, and this goes back to uh, a previous point that I made about the fact that currently the Safe Banking Act doesn't mention equity, uh, and I find that problematic. Um, I think that equity is a, a separate public policy objective than diversity and inclusion, uh, and one that is equally worthy uh, of being acknowledged and addressed. Uh, and so we're recommending that the Safe Banking Act not only uh, include equity, uh, but that it be prioritized as well. Um, as it relates to the data collection uh, for the cannabis industry, currently there are requirements for diversity and inclusion that focus on collecting information uh, about women-owned and minority-owned businesses. Uh, and the reality is that the federal government really needs to develop its own core competency on cannabis regulation in general. Um, you know, you know, we heard the DOJ say that it's monitoring efforts, uh, at legalization at the state, uh, but this really needs to be a, a comprehensive uh, effort uh, because they're all different types of data points that states are collecting and it's important for us to be able to determine what a best practice is to be able to compare those practices. Uh, one of the most common practices that we're seeing uh, uh, increasingly in state jurisdictions is an effort to promote equity programs specifically uh, with programs designed to try and, and intentionally acknowledge the harm to the war on drugs and allow for uh, these folks to have equitable access uh, to the cannabis industry. That being said, the uh, paper recommends that we expand our reporting requirements so that we're not just collecting information on minority uh, and women-owned businesses, but equity-owned businesses as well. I think we have an opportunity right now uh, to encourage states to share how they're defining equity uh, with the federal government. I, I do think that there needs to be a comprehensive uh, conversation and discussion about how uh, different jurisdictions are defining equity. And again, we won't be able to understand those disparities uh, and be able to address them if we don't identify them. So we view this as an opportunity for us to collect information uh, related to equity owned businesses uh, as well. Another uh, sub recommendation within this particular recommendation uh, really relates to us prioritizing uh, diversity, equity and inclusion. Currently, there are two reports that the Government Accountability Office is required to uh, report back uh, to, to Congress on. And only one report, the one that's not equity related, has a deadline. Uh, 
uh, we'd like the Safe Banking Act to be amended so that there is a deadline uh, for the Government Accountability Office to be accountable uh, and share information uh, with the public about things like diversity, equity, uh, and inclusion. Uh, so we're recommending that a, a deadline be established for those reporting requirements. Our uh, sixth recommendation is for the Safe Banking Act to be amended to require federal banking regulators to identify best practices to achieve racial equity in financial services. Uh, and the point and intention behind this recommendation is really to try and get us out of this position and reality that we're in where we have to wait for disparities uh, to manifest uh, and then address them after the fact. Uh, and we really would like to be proactive uh, about preventing disparities and inequities in the first place. And so what the Safe Banking Act currently does is what we're used to doing, uh, waiting for the disparity to occur and then getting recommendations to address the disparity. Uh, what we're recommending is that federal banking regulators who have seen uh, disparities in the financial services before, they understand what best practices are, they should understand uh, what best practices are. We've at least should be able to uh, ascertain and identify uh, what uh, bad practices are in the space. We want to start before the safe harbor uh, would become effective, allow folks to have an opportunity uh, to understand uh, what best practices are. I think that we're in a better uh, situation uh, to have equitable outcomes uh, than the current approach taken by SAFE. Our uh, eighth recommendation uh, is that the Safe Banking Act be amended to identify barriers beyond marketplace entry by including barriers experienced before, during, and after the licensure process. And really, this is just an expansion of scope uh, of the existing uh, report that's there. But the existing reporting requirements is limited to barriers to marketplace entry. Uh, and what I've learned uh, from my role uh, as uh, first executive director of the city of Los Angeles Department of Cannabis Regulation is that people are experiencing barriers both before, during, and after the licensing process. Uh, and uh, we have to use this opportunity as a means to have these particular circumstances uh, identified because again, uh, we can't address what we can't acknowledge. Uh, and so we want the, the scope of this particular reporting requirement uh, expanded. Furthermore, uh, we believe that this particular study should include a comprehensive review of state and local efforts to identify and address barriers related to entry. There's already a study uh, on marketplace barriers to entry, uh, but I could imagine the study being done and important stakeholders not being uh, equitably invited to the table. So what we do in our recommendation uh, is recommend that uh, there be direct engagement with both cannabis and hemp regulators uh, and cannabis and hemp business owners. Uh, our ninth recommendation uh, is to make sure that SAFE is amended so that we're not just studying diversity, equity, and inclusion in the cannabis industry, but the hemp industry as well. Uh, and I think that this would be a huge missed opportunity if we don't take this op opportunity to expand uh, the, the scope of SAFE in this way. Uh, SAFE in its language provides provisions bo for both cannabis businesses and hemp businesses. So I wanna clarify that this is not us uh, bringing something to the table that's not already a part of the conversation. Uh, hemp businesses are actually struggling with access to banking, <laughs> despite the fact that uh, uh, you know hemp uh, and the hemp industry was legalized through the Farm Bill. Um, and yet the Safe Banking Act uh, and, its, and all of its intention to uh, promote diversity and inclusion focuses exclusively uh, on the cannabis industry. Uh, and we know uh, from, from our own experience and anecdotally that there are huge disparities uh, in the hemp industry as well. And so we wanna make sure uh, that we're not just collecting uh, data in the cannabis industry, but in the hemp industry as well. And similarly, we'd like the Government Accountability Office not just to conduct a study on barriers to the cannabis industry, 
uh, but barriers uh, that exist when folks are seeking to enter and participate uh, in the hemp industry uh, as well. And our last recommendation uh, is that safe be amended to promote compliance with state and local regulatory requirements re regarding business ownership. Uh, and really the intention behind this recommendation is to acknowledge that while uh, existing safe provisions seek to collect data around minority owned and women owned businesses, state and local jurisdictions have uh, varied definitions of what it means to be an owner. And in order for us to be able to do that comparative analysis uh, of, of you know, what businesses are truly owned uh, by women or uh, owned by minorities or owned by equity applicants, uh, there needs to be an assessment uh, collection of data around the definition uh, of ownership. Um, and similarly, this is kind of the last part of this recommendation, uh, when financial institutions are conducting their customer due diligence, they're often uh, having access to information to confirm a business's ownership. We recommend that uh, safe be amended so that if during a financial institution's uh, customer due diligence, they identify information related to ownership that is inconsistent uh, with the local or state definition of ownership that they be required to report that information. Uh, again, related to uh, you know, programs that are developed to try and uh, help uh, you know, equity applicants or uh, minority owned businesses uh, own these businesses. We know that there are lots of predatory practices uh, that are happening in the industry and we have to be able to use the tools that are available to us uh, to be able to assess uh, when folks are flouting ownership rules. And so we feel as though by uh, promoting compliance uh, with state and local regulatory requirements in this way, uh, we are also promoting equity in the cannabis industry. Thanks so much for that overview, Kat, and to Shaleen and Rafi as well. Um, for folks who are listening, definitely recommend downloading the paper and digging into these recommendations in your own time. Um, but that was a really great overview, so thanks, thanks all. Um, before we dive into audience, question, audience questions, I did have just a general question for the panel. I'd like to um, just hear from you all, you know, what do you think is the importance of equity within all cannabis policy? including banking. I know we talked a lot about banking, but why is equity also important in other you know, aspects of cannabis policy? I can jump in. Um, you know, my own story was really the dichotomous nature of working on the West Coast um, with predominantly white men in private equity firms and or large operations that were making, you know, million dollar moves moves in the industry. Um, but then going back home to Brooklyn, New York, and um, this is pre-legalization and still seeing young um, people of color, usually young men of color being harassed by police for um, a joint. And so I think the history of cannabis in our country, which uh, Dr. Rachel Knox does an amazing overview of that and um, some of our education, but dating all the way back to hemp being the cash crop and slaves growing hemp, I think that it would be an extraordinary disservice to launch this new industry, which we've kind of already done so, without equity centered. Um, and after feeling that in my first year in the industry, I, I made a very, very easy decision to make that a mission, um, regardless of the type of work that I was doing. And so within policy, I think right now we're just catching up after 2020 and sort of the George Floyd effect. Uh, but this is something that should have been centered from the beginning because we criminalized it with clear racial biases. Um, we've seen multiple reports. We have a lot of data showing the um, inequity and the racial bias and enforcement. And I think that with that level of inequity and impact that has trickled down to seeing black and brown communities being the sickest and the poorest um, and the severest impact of a pandemic, which just occurred, that we have to reverse that. And, and that means centering equity in the policies um, as we approach cannabis legalization. Uh, 
I'll just add to that. Um, we have around the country, it's, it's a small percentage that are black and equity owned businesses, but we have a lot of them and they have overcome uh, incredible odds to get to where they are with integrity and grit and perseverance. And so say for Climax or CAOF, whatever it is that we're looking at, I'm always thinking about those businesses and how we make sure that they're gonna keep thriving. Well, on that note, that's actually a perfect segue into our audience questions. Um, someone did specifically ask about the Climb Act and people's views on that. Does anybody want to speak to that? I guess that's on me since I brought it up. Um, I, I have concerns about the way the Climb Act is being presented. And uh, for example, the fact that uh, the press release didn't mention that it would be allowing cannabis businesses to list on stock exchanges. Um, so I, I just need to read it more thoroughly, but my initial reactions are similar to my initial reactions of the Safe Banking Act. So in that same vein around policy, why do the amendments that were presented in this white paper not address other major issues that people raise all the time, like expungements or 280E reform. Why not address those issues with these amendments? I, I will actually prefer Rafi as someone from the banking industry to answer, but I, you know, I'm no lawyer. I'm definitely not coming from the banking industry, but I do understand strategy. And the reality is that everyone is talking about this being stalled by, um, you know, the senators that are introducing a more comprehensive bill. Um, but in reality, um, you know, what we realize is in order to pass the bill, you have to actually allow it a strategic pathway to passage um, that is definitely focused on the elements in the bill. The bill has been marketed as a bill for people, a bill for equity, a bill for racial justice in some ways, um, but that is conflated. It is a bill for institutions, financial institutions, and so our amendments are strategically for um, that sector and um, and can be applicable. There aren't, you know, so pie in the sky that now we send it down a different pathway and completely derails the passage um, capability for the bill. I think uh, part of it, too, is that a lot of the speculation around federal cannabis legalization, uh, at least recently, has centered around uh, what have been characterized as these dueling pushes for either uh, incremental reform or comprehensive reform. Uh, now, personally, you know, the, the harm was comprehensive. Uh, so I think ultimately the reform will need to be comprehensive uh, as well. Uh, but I think part of what we're trying to point out in this paper and through the analysis of, of the Safe Banking Act is that even if uh, Congress is simply going to move on a standalone issue banking, uh, there's no reason uh, why they can't move cannabis banking reform and do so equitably. Uh, but I think uh, organizers and advocates in this space have to acknowledge uh, that, uh, you know, equity isn't going to be achieved in silence. Uh, we, we can't sit here uh, and uh, assume uh, that uh, the, uh, these outcomes are going to be equitable uh, in and of themselves. Uh, we need explicit provisions, uh, just like there were explicit <laughs> provisions uh, that caused inequity. Uh, we're going to need explicit provisions uh, that address and promote uh, equity. Uh, and, and so... I think that that's part of the reason why our analysis centered around, okay, if we're just going to talk about banking, if, if folks don't want to talk about anything else but banking, if despite all of the harms, the hypocrisy, the insanity that we see going on around the country uh, right now due to cannabis prohibition, if this is what tops your priority list, uh, then this is a way that we can at least address it uh, more equitably. Yeah, I just want to add to that too. There's nothing wrong with all of those things and they should definitely pass, but they have nothing to do with this issue. And it's almost kind of offensive when people present it as though it is, because if I'm a small business and I can't get banking and I need it, and you're telling me that this bill is going to, 
and it doesn't. And then you throw in something completely unrelated, like, great, maybe you had a salad yesterday and that was a good thing for you, but it has absolutely nothing to do with me and my banking. All right, um, now turning to the banking section of our talk, um, Rafi, there were a couple of questions um, that I'm hoping you can address um, related to how banks make determine who they're gonna you know, serve and who they're gonna lend to. Um, folks are asking, you know, isn't it fair game for banks to get make different loan amounts and interest rates uh, based on credit worthiness and uh, capital structure? How is it different for cannabis? Like, why is that metric, I guess, different when we're talking about cannabis? Well, I think uh, to Dashita's point earlier, it's not different for cannabis. The fact is our financial services industry is rooted in discrimination and disparities that have absolutely nothing to do with cannabis. What we're trying to do here is ensure uh, to the best of our capabilities that those same disparities are not replicated when it comes to cannabis banking, when it comes to cannabis insurance, when it comes to providing financial services to these same individuals who've already been harmed multiple times over, um, now we're going to uh, you know, continue to place additional barriers and obstacles in their way. So by all means, uh, financial institutions are free to make their own risk-based assessments about who they choose to bank. But to my point earlier, I think the crux of it, it's not guidance from FinCEN, it's not legislation from Congress, it's really having financial institutions do some deep soul searching. How did we get to where we are with the disparities that we see in our financial services industry, with our disparities in lending? How can we undo some of that work? And since we are specifically talking about cannabis and repairing the harms done through cannabis prohibition, I think it's a great jumping off point to start having those conversations via cannabis about the larger uh, disparities that we see in the financial services industry. So no, there is no, there is no difference, um, but let's reimagine what risk assessments can look like. Let's reimagine um, being able to have a conversation with uh, a potential client, whereas, hey, you know, I ran your, your name and I see that um, you have a prior conviction for, for cannabis. I see that you've received a cultivation license in the state of, you know, X. Um, perhaps, you know, was your conviction related to uh, the cultivation of cannabis? Oh, it was. Well, how many years did you do that? So you actually have experience in cultivating cannabis. So this license that you've been issued, um, you're likely to be able to successfully run this business because although uh, you were doing it um, under federal prohibition and, and state prohibition, you successfully did this for many, many years. Um, so that's what we're really talking about, reimagining what financial institutions are doing when they're drafting policies, when they're uh, assessing risk, and when they're onboarding their customers. Can I also uh, just quickly piggyback and say that um, we're not also suggesting that we change the credit worthiness um, as maybe a tool, but a 2021 Federal Reserve um, report, and we talk more about this in the paper, showed that it, even with the same or higher credit scores, um, Black and Latino uh, business owners um, received lending um, approvals at half the rate of their white counterparts. So we are not talking about we made up racial uh, discrimination. We have decades of data, and all we're saying is that if cannabis is supposed to be grounded in equity, if you're a private company that relieves that and that is part of your marketing and it's the fabric of your, your company, then you should understand the banking industry has uh, been perpetuating racial disparities and we don't want to necessarily bring that into the cannabis space. Um, and that's sort of uh, our approach to it. But it isn't about changing the bar necessarily. The bar gets changed because of race is what we're showing in the data. Thank you. Another audience question for the panel, as it is, do you think the safe banking bill will reduce debt costs for existing businesses? Also, do you think it will allow payments and dispensaries via credit cards?
as far as the as is the debt again banking sort of like gas i use the gas right now because everybody knows what they're feeling at the pump is an unchecked um industry in terms of their pricing and costs having been on a panel with the lead lobbyists for the aba uh essentially they don't want any changes because they're not necessarily interested in pushing their members to uh have to confine themselves to a certain uh standard of of, uh, business with cannabis uh, um, uh, industry businesses. I would also point to Pennsylvania, which passed their version of SAFE at the state level, and that same lobbying group added a clause to allow banks to opt out of being able to work with cannabis businesses. So I think we have a very, again, conflated perspective on whether banks really want to do business here. Um, and when they will do it, they understand that it's a money-making opportunity for them. That gives them more opportunity to have higher fees because of the risk and 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 also higher interest rates so i think um we shouldn't assume that because there's more access that they will um have more competition and therefore the prices will decrease there's nothing to check it yeah and i would just like to add that you know just yesterday i was having a conversation with um a, a, a banking official who was telling me that they'd done uh i think a hundred million dollars in cannabis lending um and that, you know, he treats it just like any kind of commercial um, lending. However, they charge higher interest rates. He said, you know, he was very nonchalant about it. Like cannabis lending, it's no different than any other commercial business I'm doing. Um, but I charge higher rates for it and gave no justification for doing so. Um, and so nothing in, in safe as it's written is going to prevent that. Um, and so these are the issues that um, that we want to bring to to the to the public's attention. On the credit card question, I don't think anybody knows for sure, but I, I'm going to guess no. I'll, I'll put that on record. I don't think so. We had some questions regarding political viability of these amendments. Um, so you know, why not include these recommendations in another vehicle, like the CAOA, for example? And can you also speak to if you all think adding these amendments to SAFE could potentially, you know, lose bipartisan support that the SAFE bill currently has? Anything involving equity and black and brown people typically loses Republican support. So I anticipate there will be some pushback. Um, but I do think that there is a lot of uh, congruence with the small businesses, um, uh, rural farmers that are also struggling with access um, for an entirely different reason that some of our uh, amendments also address. And so I think that there's a meeting ground and that's something we learn as we are implementing law, that there's a meeting ground where we're all really struggling. Cannabis is largely a small business industry with more than 70%, less than 2 million in revenue overall. And so I think that the goal is to make the industry more viable than we hope that we can meet in the middle on that. Um, and then lastly, I would say all of these things have been, you know, really discussed um, for a better part of the last six to eight months on the Hill. And um, we continue to dive even deeper um, with uh, legislature, legislators about where we think more tweaking can happen and where these type of amendments can um, be made in more comprehensive bills. Yeah, you asked um, why not make these changes in the CAO Act. I think that we all recognize that is not likely and very likely impossible uh, to pass in the short term, whereas the Safe Banking Act is. But we still need to push for both. And in fact, we did see some of our recommendations reflected in the new draft. And so I think it's important to push all of these avenues and certainly on the access to capital piece. 280E is not the only source of revenue and the only mechanism for access to capital. There's lots of ways that we can do it. Um, on the political question, I run a nonprofit think tank called Parabola Center, and we really focus on finding where small businesses, like Dashita alluded to, um, and people of color and veteran-owned businesses uh, can all thrive, particularly when we talk about anti-monopoly policies. And I think we have a lot more in common there um, than we have different, and that certainly appeals to Republicans as well. 
Thanks. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. So I'm going to turn it back to the panelists just for some last thoughts. Um, but first, I just wanted to thank you all. This truly was an amazing panel. Um, the same was said in the chat. Um, and one person asked actually how they can support the work that you all are doing and how they can continue to center equity in cannabis banking. So if folks want to address that in their last remarks, how people can get involved, that would be great. Um, so whoever, whoever would like to start, please, please take it away. I can I can start. I uh, want to again just thank the center for supporting us in this work, uh, our colleagues for uh, their critical analysis of this paper. Um, we want folks feedback on these recommendations. Uh, I don't think that there's ever a wrong time for us to be discussing equity. Uh, and so we're going to continue to raise this issue uh, via every platform and venue uh, that we have. Uh, and we encourage folks to do the same uh, to make sure that when uh, folks are at the table negotiating, they at least have an opportunity uh, to consider these issues. If we're not acknowledging them, uh, we're not going to be able to address them. If you're interested in supporting CRCC, I will drop the link in the chat as well. Um, but the Cannabis Regulators of Color Coalition is um, thriving and continuing to do the work at every level that we talk about legalization um, and regulation, literally from federal down to the municipal level. If you're in need of support, um, our uh, email address is info at crc-coalition.org. Um, many of the attendees here have reached out and we've had success in states like New Jersey, um, as well as in Oregon, uh, bringing our message and memos and details and insights. Um, we continue to uh, focus on growing our membership but of course it is dependent on us uh, being in these spaces. So if you have that capability, I'm also always encouraging people to do a rotation in government um, because it's actually very fascinating um, as a businesswoman to see a multi-trillion dollar business, um, businesses being mismanaged in some ways, but we actually can create solutions if we understand the inside part as well as the private sector. Um, and so, yeah, I'll pass the mic on that one. Thank you again for having us. This was definitely much needed. I actually feel better <laughs> that we were able to share this and so it's, it's been going on for some time. Definitely. Um, for, I definitely want to thank um, Maritza. This is, uh, you've been a wonderful moderator, um, but you've also been an extraordinary partner in this journey um, of getting this paper out um, to, to the public onto the Hill and just you know informing our thoughts um, on this work. And so thank you so much for also um, and always being an, an ally to us. Um, and I want to take this public opportunity to thank my CRCC sisters. Um, we are a, a phenomenal bunch and I don't think that we um, acknowledge that um, ourselves enough. And we rocked this paper, <laughs> I'm sorry, but we did. Um, and these conversations are important and it's important as, as Dashita stated um, for us to be in this space, but for also for us to be seen in this space. And so I am very proud to sit amongst these women, um, Maritza included, you know, honorary CRCC. I'm always proud to sit amongst and, and speak with and converse with and just um, have these wonderful conversations amongst this this group um, and to be able to share those conversations um, with you all in the form of this paper and in the form of this uh, forum today um, is truly um, remarkable. I regret going last <laughs> following those up. Um, I want to just close actually by answering uh, the way that I think you could support is really pay attention in all of these issues to the timing, because if you look at any state and how it's rolled out, the timing of who has gone first and how is so, so important. And you saw that in uh, the Interstate Commerce Deep Dive, you'll see that in the next Deep Dive, and in this one as well, it really matters like how we initially address this banking issue. So just keep that in mind. Um, I want to thank all four of you. I look up to all of you for different reasons and really am grateful for your collaboration and, and sisterhood. And I want to thank the Drug Enforcement and Policy Center, always true to its mission in enriching these conversations and for trusting us as well. Thank you.
All right, with that, we'll go ahead and close the panel. Don't miss the next Cannabis Regulatory Deep Dive on August 30th. Thanks so much to our panel. Thank you for joining the audience. Bye.